It is my great honor to welcome Reverend Bobby Kilgore, who's going to speak to us today about depression and spirituality. A timely topic, I believe. Yeah. You're always here when we need you. It just works out. You're here when we need you. I was going to do one talk about anger, loss, depression, and the use of spirituality and spiritual practices in support of these things. And when I started looking at it, I'm like, that's actually three different topics I could do three talks on. So you've heard the one on anger and spirituality. You've heard the one on loss and spirituality. This is the one on depression and spiritual practices. So ancient practitioners of spirituality used to worship the sun. I read a paper by Dr. Charles Rayson, who is a very well-reputed American psychiatrist and a very renowned mental health expert. A lot of practices in the ancient world found throughout different cultural and geographical locations were done for healing and spiritual reasonings and seemed to have a severe effect on depression. Now, it is interesting to note that we can take these practices from the old world and apply them today. And we can apply them in this modern world for our mental and emotional well being. We can repurpose these ancient practices in our lifestyles in a way of fighting depression. We might also catch the attention of how these ancient spiritual practices that were rehearsed as a way to induce a trance and a heightened spiritual state of awareness and mind are exempted out of the behaviors that were necessary for survival. Most of these ancient practices that might help with fighting depression have evolved from strategies of survival. What is truly fascinating is that most of these activities are practiced across different cultures and different religions. We need to bring back ancient well-being inputs and integrate them into our life. This will provide us with a foundation of stability and well-being. There are six ancient practices that I found that according to history help with depression in the modern world. The first is my favorite, and you've heard me speak to this often, spending time in nature. We humans are very flexible animals. We have evolved in the process of thousands of years and adapted our behavior according to our circumstances. We tend to experience a lot of species typical behavior and a lot of species typical needs from the environment. We have co-evolved with various microorganisms that are essential for maintaining our health. Let's call them environmental signals that, would, that are needed to heal ourselves in time and space in our behavior. A lot of these signals are needed for well-being have been destroyed by our modern world. We have formed codependency with microorganisms that we have evolved with, but these organisms have been destroyed or eradicated in the modern world. These microbiomes and pseudocommensal organisms, these are organisms that are not reproducing or residing in us, but maintain a persistent presence through a continual reintroduction via our environment, are not only important in maintaining a healthy gut and immune system, but also important in fighting depression. During, due to over sterilization of our environment, we have lost contact with these organisms that are important to our health. Spending time in nature can reintroduce them to us and to our bodies, and it can have, yeah, I can talk, I really can, numerous beneficial effects. When I wrote this, I knew what I was saying. Just saying. Other than that, numerous studies have found that ecotherapy, which basically involves doing various activities in the natural environment, has shown to help with mild to moderate depression. Now, this is not to say that some of us don't have to be on medication, okay? When I first came back to my first combat tour, Zoloft was my best friend, okay? I guess I tried everything. They tried me on different medications, and whatever you do, don't ever take Wellbutin. That made me suicidal. Okay, but Zoloft was my best friend for several years. 
I wouldn't have minded staying on it. But they're like, oh, yeah, you're good. And they took me off of it. But many cultures around the world use phasic exposure to high heat as well for healing. It is important to note that by heat exposure, we may staying in high heat temperatures in a periodic manner, not too long, as opposed to natural Florida heat, natural Florida weather. Pre-Hispanic indigenous people from Mesoamerica used to use heat called, I hope I pronounced this correctly, Timizacol, originated from the Natural word, which means house of heat or hot bath. Sweat lodges as a way to heal themselves. When I was in Oklahoma, I had a Lakota medicine woman that would hold heat lodges for soldiers, which I attended and I definitely benefited from them. In 2012, a researcher, actually two researchers, John Bark and Edith Shalif, conducted a study where they found a positive link between taking hot baths and mental wellness. Well, I'll tell you what, every night I'm in a hot bath with Epsom salts for my back and it helps my emotional wellness. But another study found that inducing whole body hyperthermia, not hypothermia, hyperthermia, high heat, had a significant impact on reducing symptoms of depression. This was found on the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale. Even in Ayurveda and in the ancient texts, they talk about therapeutic hot baths with rose petals, honey, milk, and turmeric as a way to restore balance in mind, body, and spirit. Hmm. Hot baths with essential oil. Hmm. Just saying. Ancient Greeks took steam baths called Laconia, and the water was generally heated by fire underneath or by hot rocks, heated in the fire and placed beneath the bath. These baths were used to relax and unwind and other various therapeutic purposes. According to them, soaking oneself in lavender scented water, hmm, lavender, just saying, was a way to relax and calm the nerves. I use lavender spray on my pillow to sleep at night. Now, another thing, a lot of people will, will equate this to Christianity, but actually it crosses all faiths. Fasting. Fasting is a way to cleanse the mind. And it's days without going without, they say foods and liquids, but I always still drink water when I do my fast. But it's, it's a way to offer prayers to your divine source, but it's done in order to cleanse your body. And almost all religions from the world, both indigenous and world fasting, I'm sorry, in almost all the religions of the world, including the indigenous, world fasting has been a key element. Fasting is practiced by many people as a way to connect one's soul to the divine source. Amongst many ancient practices to cure depression, fasting is one of the most explored methods. And almost all of your major religions, be it Hinduism, Christianity, Islam, Jainism, etc., have all specific dates for fasting as a way to get closer to God and as a way to ask for forgiveness for any sins or, or ill behavior committed. Fasting has very many anti-inflammatory and positive impacts on your metabolism. I'm still working on mine. It clears the brain and mind, awakens the senses, and it also improves your brain functioning. Dr. Dandiel, a neurosurgeon, swears by fasting as a way to improve your mood and cognitive abilities. Fasting also makes you mind more mindful of your body and you're more aware of your surroundings due to a heightened state of brain power. Few studies that have been conducted on animals also suggest that fasting can protect against diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. It has been established by numbers of controlled studies that by controlling your calorie intake and consuming an anti-inflammatory diet, I love ginger, ginger's anti-inflammatory, hint, 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 hint. It leads to an increase in remission rates and a decrease in peripheral inflammation signs and signals. The results have also indicated an improvement in the range of depressive symptoms from depressed move, cognitive difficulties, and irritability. These spiritual ancient practices can work 
for just about curing depression. Now, the text I came across says curing depression. No, I'm sorry. It may help depression, but it's not going to cure it. Everybody has a certain amount of depression, you know, especially this week with everything going on. Now, this I found really interesting because what did I do a lot of in the military? Running. And in the Marine Corps, I belonged to the 100 mile club because I ran 100 miles about every three weeks. Many cultures have used rigorous or long distance running to induce a sort of powerful spiritual state. In many cultures and religions, long distance running is considered to be an activity that can clear your mind of unwanted thoughts. It works. It makes you more spiritual and it gives you a feeling of a trance. I know when I used to run, because I can't run anymore. At first, I started just running in the morning with my units. But then at the end of the day, after all of the stresses of the day, I found myself putting on my shorts, my t-shirts, my tennis shoes and going out for a run, which began with one mile, ended up five and 10 at night because the sun was setting. It was cool. I could run through the woods with the trees and smell nature. And I just felt better. I slept better at night. Now, as many of you know, we have the Buddhist congregation, which moved down from Coco down to here. And my research is very interesting because the Tibetan Buddhist practice long distance running. There is a concept of achieving Buddhahood, Buddhahood in one's lifetime or enlightenment. The best way to come closer to the mind state of Buddha is running to the point of exhaustion, according to these Buddhists. They have a tradition, I really hope I can pronounce this correctly, Kaihogyo, performed by the Tendai Buddhist monks. This practice involves walking around a route on Mount Hai while offering prayers at shrines and other sacred places, much like the White Sands Buddhist Monastery in Mems. You walk around and you say prayers at different points, walking up to the pyramid with the Buddha on it. <clears throat> but before performing this ritual, I you ready for this. They trained for seven years. And I'll say that again. And I'm going to even say an intensive training for seven years. There is two versions, and I'll let you pick the version that you would follow. So the first one revolved running for 100 days. The second one involved running for 1,000 days. While performing this ritual, monks would run as long as 50 miles a day. Now, before you sit there and go, whoa, 50 miles a day? We walk at five miles an hour. So if you're running, that's 10 miles an hour at least, depending on how fast you run. I'm slow. I run 10 miles an hour. I used to. So 50 miles a day, 10 hours a day. But it was a massive inducer for a transcendent state. Now, in Native America, certain tribes, people use long distance running to overcome a lot of challenges, like alcoholism and drug use. I was watching a program the other night on the History Channel, and we used to hunt dinosaurs and various beasts, and we could outrun them because we could run long distances. And people were like, well, how's that possible? Well, when I was in the military and I had to teach a young soldier how to run, I taught him how to run with what I called my Indian pace, which is a very easy pace. You breathe in and out on the same foot and you just keep that easy pace. You can run forever. I even ran a, a, a 10K one time in, in Afghanistan with that pace. Dan Lieberman from Harvard believes that human brains might have evolved because of long distance running. It is believed that this running can induce rapid shifts in autonomic nervous systems. It also can be a sealant for the mind of enlightenment. And as they say, a run a day keeps depression at bay. Many doctors, as well as a study published in Harvard Medical Journals, claim that long distance running can actually help with regulating parts of the brain that are associated with mood regulation. Now we're back to the sun. Ancient practices worship the sun. Too many cultures and religions from around the world had various rituals that involved worshiping the sun. In some cultures, it was considered a deity, while others 
considered it a powerful source of sustained life on earth. In Hinduism, the practice of worshiping the sun early in the morning or pouring water from a flask and chanting religious mantras is supposed to be a daily ritual. And I'm here to tell you it is. Let me grab a sip of water real quick. There is an Asian restaurant in Merrill Island that I go to quite often. And one day I got there before it opened. And here came the owner. He had his incense sticks. He faced to the north and he chanted his prayers. And he placed incense sticks by the front door. And I asked him, I said, so do you do this every morning? He said, yes. He says, I greet the sun as it rises. And it ensures that I will have a profitable day. Okay. Now, many people are very familiar with the Egyptian culture who called the sun Ra. And this was one of the most important gods. In fact, there was one pharaoh that decided to do away with, with multiple gods and just only have the monotheistic Ra. And everybody was very angry about that. So when he died, they went back to having many gods. But many religious cultures practice this. Mithraism, Roman religion, Buddhism. Druidism, the Aztecs, Incas, and native, many Native Americans. In the ancient Vedic literature, Sura Namaskar, or sun salutation, was practiced as a way to offer prayers and salutations to the Almighty Sun. It involves a series of mudras that were done in front of the sun. As Persian societies, they honored the rising sun and it was considered a very important part of their culture. Spending time outside in the sunrise is, to said to have, is said to have many numerous benefits on health. It has also been linked in maintaining a healthy mental state. Exposure to both sunlight and darkness can trigger the secretion of hormones in your brain. Exposure to the right amount of sunlight is considered to trigger the release of serotonin, which everybody knows is the feel-good hormone. It can and have a mood boosting effect on the brain. Low levels of serotonin can actually make one sad or depressed. In Alaska, because they have long days and long nights, people can suffer from seasonal affect disorder or sad. And they have to have sun lamps to expose them to a certain amount of light throughout the day to improve their mental well being. And finally, we're not going to leave out the moon. There's an age old practice of worshiping the moon. Similar to sun worship, lunar worship was also common across many cultures and religions. It was a dominant place in ancient spiritual traditions. <laughs> many religions and societies from around the world, excuse me, <coughs> worshiped the moon in different ways, from chanting mantras to having a breakfast fast. The moon is also a dominant symbol of Islamic culture. Notice the crescent moon is their symbol. In Hinduism, there are specific rituals for new moons and full moon days. They generally observe fasts at different stages of the lunar cycle, and they believe that this has a great effect on an individual's mood cycle. According to the Ayurveda and many scientific beliefs, moon bathing can have a calming, cooling, soothing effect on your mind and body. Now, as we women know, our cycles are governed by the moon. We also know that the ocean's tides are governed by the moon. So worshiping the moon has been practiced for ages and is still practiced today. It is said to have a positive health benefit with respect to especially female fertility. I don't know about that. Although there is no research or data to support that claim, many believe that the moon can intensify your feelings. Full moon days can make you more sociable, while sometimes new moons can make you more irritable. I don't know about that either, because I've been very happy on new moon days. But we do know that the moon has its effect on us, whether it be full, whether it be waxing, full, or waning. I always pay attention on my little weather app on my phone as to where the moon is at, so I know what to expect. I welcome any questions or comments.